records started when the Petrillo ban on recording ended, I believe 1948. They got into the classical business in, in an interesting route. They merged with John Hammond's company, which was called Kino. John Hammond was, was a, a great uh, music impresario in this, in this country. He uh, discovered Billie Holiday, Aretha Franklin, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan. Uh, my father, uh, C. Robert Fine, was the, the chief engineer for Majestic Records. So he and John Hammond found they worked together well. They had the they had a, a same view about how you record something. They both believed in, in uh, minimal microphones, you know, minimal point sources for the sound, and also um, a natural room ambience to things. Single mic and the, the high fidelity was, was the initial approach, even going back to the pre-LP era. You know, they did the best they could with the technology at the time. You talk about full frequency recording. This had been pioneered by DECA in England, and this was at the end of the 78 era. And they, what they were able to do is basically take an attitude, you know what, these recordings are not made to be played back on acoustic players in people's houses. This is going to be a high fidelity recording. You're going to need a high fidelity cartridge and a high fidelity reproducer to, to get this full frequency sound. She had come from working for Antal Dorati at the Minneapolis Symphony in those days. She had worked for him in Dallas and then Minneapolis. And my mother said to Irving Green, you know, you can build a good catalog with this company. There are a lot of New York, or there are a lot of American orchestras that are not signed right now because of the chaos after the recording ban and the switch over to LP. One of those orchestras happens to be the Chicago Symphony, Mercury's hometown orchestra. At the same time this, this is going on, um, David Hall had, had signed the Louisville Orchestra to make, it, to make a recording. At Reeves, they had bought one of the first sold in the U.S. of the Neumann U47 microphone, which was a Telefunken U47 when it was sold in the U.S. It was sold through Telefunken and Badge Telefunken. So they went out to Louisville, they recorded um, pieces by um, William Schumann and two of his ballets, and it did. It was rejected for artistic reasons, according to the Mercury logs. And Louisville Orchestra was in New York performing at the holidays. They came to Reeves, and Reed recorded this successfully. Um, it was the first U.S. orchestral recording with a with a Neumann U47 microphone. So this was released come 1951. At the same time, my mother and Irving Green successfully negotiated with the Chicago Symphony and their new um, conductor, Raphael Kubelik. April 1951, my father was dispatched to record the Chicago Symphony with David Hall, and, and um, they made the first recording, which was Pictures in an Exhibition, which is in the first Mercury box set. pre-amplifier was there in, in Orchestra Hall. It was then sent over a leased phone line to Universal Recording Studio, which was Bill Putnam's studio in Chicago. The first LP came out and the music critic of the New York Times described it as being in the living presence of the orchestra. And that's how the brand was, was uh, born. So that started Mercury Living Presence. Basically. 